Good morning. My name is Erica Grunst, and I am currently serving in the Hope College Ministries. I'm going to be reading today's scripture, so please stand. Our passage today is Galatians 5, 13 through 18. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk in the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For those things are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Erica. You may be seated. So turn to someone around you. You've already greeted them and said good morning, right? And you know kind of the drill if you've been here for a while. Can you look at them and ask them a question for me for a moment? And say to them, so what are you doing with your freedom in Christ? Ask them that for a moment. Do you mind? Well, Mark, that's a personal thing, right? You know, I, I, don't, I don't even know the person next to me, and I'm divulging this thing about my spiritual life to them. It is a very important question, because it is the topic that Paul deals with today in our lives. So today, we continue in our teaching through the book of Galatians. Today, Galatians chapter 5, again, we start uh, teaching in just a moment with verse 13, as Erica so well read to us a few moments ago. You say, Mark, we have been in chapter five now for three weeks. My goodness, uh, can we get out of that? Probably not, you know, probably not. We have another week, I know, in this chapter as we get to this list of sins that Paul, well, puts together for you and I that we find ourselves in the middle of and then also that he also gets to these amazing things called the fruit of the Spirit. And I want us to have plenty of time there as well. But I want to talk to you today again about your freedom that you find in Christ, gospel freedom. So what we have over 12 weeks together as we have studied through the book of Galatians, what we have settled in our hearts and our lives is that is of our assurance of that of salvation in Christ, our assurance of this relationship with God, and it's not based on our performance, but it's based on Christ alone. And so those are the things that we have currently settled as we have gone through that, that we have this relationship with God, and it's based upon what Christ has done for us and not what we have done for him. So it's not based on our performance. But Paul is writing this to these churches in this region of Galatia, and the fear of the legalists that he's writing to is that you and I would take that liberty, that freedom. That's why I ask you to ask your neighbor that question, that you would take that freedom and that you would use it to sin is exactly what the legalists were afraid of. And I think it's a pretty good argument on their part. Actually, I really do, knowing human behavior, I think it's a very good argument because here's the deal, right? That we love sinning and God loves forgiving. Isn't that true? That's the way it works. We love sinning. God loves forgiving, so we can handle the sinning part pretty well. I mean, we got a track record in that area. God can handle the forgiveness part. We understand that. So I'll do the sinning. God does the forgiving. God's happy. We're happy. And everybody's a big, happy family. Isn't it a wonderful deal, right? Yes. See, that's exactly what the legals were afraid of. It is. And so they were afraid that we would take this faith and, and take this forgiveness and this freedom and that we would use it to sin with. And so, you know, it it just kind of, if you look at it that way, and you hear that just that little kind of analogy that I gave you, it makes grace feel somewhat cheap, doesn't it? It does. And so what Paul says to him is, hey, listen, I want to address, I want to address the freedom that you have in Christ, and I also want to keep intact this understanding that it doesn't really free you to do anything that you want in this life. So I want to keep that intact, but also to let you understand and help you to understand that you are free in Christ. That This is not about your performance any longer, that you earn God's acceptance within your life. And so you are free to love and to serve God, not out of fear, but out of love. So how is that lived out? 
So I wrote a question. How am I to live in this gospel freedom, which seems dangerous, yet unexplainably amazing? How am I to live in this gospel freedom that seems dangerous, yet unexplainably amazing? So we start at verse 13, and it says this, for you were called to freedom brothers. I underline that word brothers. It's important that we know who Paul is talking to. Only do not use your freedom, he says, as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So what I realize in my freedom, I have an opportunity. I have an opportunity, but I can use that opportunity and I can use my freedom in that opportunity two ways. And I can use it to please God or I can use it to please me. So I start with this thought, a gospel opportunity. This gospel opportunity you and I have. And if we were to just perhaps do a survey this morning, we would go out on the street, we would go out here to the traffic light, you know, and we would go up to people's window, we'd knock on their window and then they ignore us like we're not there, right? And you, you know what I'm talking about because you've done that, right? Isn't that true? And, and, and we would say, hey, we're doing a little survey for the church and we would like to know, if I, if I were to ask you to define a Christian, then what is the first word that comes to your mind if I ask you to define a Christian? Just people on the street, do you ask them that question? And, and I wonder how many of them would say, oh, I can tell you what the first word that comes to my mind about a Christian would be, and that is liberty or that is freedom. Most likely, that's not what they would say. And for some people, if you were to ask them that, the word that they would give you is probably not a word that I could repeat on this stage. Amen? Yes, true. Because why? Because sometimes as Christians, we come across as perhaps the most bound individuals, or, or that we come across as, I, I think, the, those that are, are, are in some kind, we have our hangups, we do. And so I think those are probably the things that would be said. But here's what Paul says. Paul says, brothers, you are called to freedom. He calls us brothers. Understand who he's talking to. He's talking to the church. He's talking to those that have experience with Christ. He's not talking to those that just see God or, or, or see Jesus as, as being, well, a great prophet, a good person. You know, he's, he's a great speaker, a great orator. But these are people that have had a real personal experience with Jesus Christ. In fact, he makes that very clear to you and I in chapter 3 and verse 26. Here's what he says. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For, you, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, is what he's saying. That you've been made three free through Christ is what he's speaking about. Those are the people that he's talking to. And he said back in uh, chapter five and verse one that you've been freed from something. And that is that this legalistic relationship with God, you've been freed from that of trying to earn things that God has already given you freely, but you've been freed to something as well. And you've been free to serve God, not out of fear, but yet that end of experience and, a, and a, a, an experience of love with Christ. So now you're following God through love, that that love is energized by the story of the gospel and the event of the gospel in your life, and it's no longer fear. You're freed from that doctrine, as we taught a few weeks ago, of the carrot and the stick. Go back two weeks, listen to the teaching, and you'll understand what that means. So how are you using this opportunity? How are you using this opportunity that God has given you? That's important. And then Paul says, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. You see, here's what we're freed from. We're freed from that of trying to merit God's acceptance in our life by that of living by the law. He's freed us from that. But we're not freed from that of pleasing God through keeping God's commandments and keeping God's guidelines that he speaks in Scripture and pleasing him through that. And what I realize is what the good news of the gospel does in my life and your life, that it erodes our motivation to sin. It takes that away so that all of a sudden, the way I look at life has changed. So the question is not how can I live, but how can I live for him? You see, that's what the legalists were afraid of. They're afraid that our question would always be, how can I live? What can I do for myself? How can I, you know, how can I use this freedom to, to just um, 
meet the own desires of my own heart and my own life. And, and yet what we realize, the gospel transitions that. It takes the motivation for sin away from us. And it says to us, how can I live for him is what it does. And what Paul teaches us here is we have two natures within us is what we do. We have two natures. We have the spirit. We have the sinful nature. And he uses the word flesh. It's from the Greek word zarx. And the, re- the Greek word zarx is a very interesting word that he uses here. Sarks is this amazing word that I think helps us to understand what is going on inside of you and I today and and how this battle is raging within us concerning that of of our flesh and the spirit. Now, when he uses this word, Sarks, this Greek word, don't misunderstand because it's not a battle about something that's outside of us and something that is within inside of us. That is not, it's not our physical nature that opposes our spiritual nature. That's not what he's talking about at all. But it, it is that sin desiring aspect of us that opposes the God desiring aspect of you and I. It's about our sinful heart is what he's talking about. In fact, when he talks about the flesh, he's not talking about our hands or not he's talking about our mouth or our eyes or our feet at all. That's not it at all. But the part of my heart that is yet to be spiritually renewed is what he's talking about within us. So I think we have to be careful to see what this is, that this is not the battle between something that is in us and something that is outside of us. That's not it at all. But it's a battle within us because the way he uses this word and talks about this for a moment with you and I is that both of these desires within us have the capacity to simply produce character qualities within us. So it's something inside of you and I that battles. As you are sitting here right now, it's taking place. There's something inside of you that says, don't listen to Mark. You know, don't listen to that. You don't need that this morning that you can fix yourself. And then the spirit of God inside of you is saying, wait a minute, you need to listen to the scripture. You need to listen to my words is what you need to listen to because only God can fix you when you're broken in life. So there is this battle that's going on inside of every one of us in this room. There's two desires is what he's talking about that battle against each other. And so what I realize is that at the moment of conversion, that the Holy Spirit takes up resident in our life. It does. So understand what he's talking about here. It's not the battle between that of something inside of us and something's outside of us. This is going on inside of you this morning. And so the Holy Spirit, at the moment of conversion, he takes up residence within your life. He has a distinct purpose. We're gonna talk about that in a moment and what he does in your life. But what I realize also is that in this broken world, there is part of you and I that's unregenerated, and all of a sudden what happens in our life is there is this collision inside of us, right? There is collision. And many times, you know, th- that your heart is in the middle of that. For most of you, for many of you, it's your mind is in the middle of that as well. And so there's this battle that's taking place inside of you against that of your new nature and your old nature is what it is. And that's what Paul is talking about when he talks about the flesh. It's about our desire. Now, I have to say something to you this morning, and this is that you're not always going to get this right. You're not always going to have your spirit overcome the flesh. There are going to be times that your flesh overcomes your spirit. Now, don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about, right? You do. Yes. You're trolling the parking lot of Walmart. You say, Mark, I don't go to Walmart. I know some of you go to Target, right? Target, right? So it's a little higher Walmart. And, uh, and so I'm trolling the parking lot of Walmart looking for the perfect parking space, right? And I'm praying and asking for God to direct me at this moment, right? Because the Lord knows that I don't want to walk any further than I have to. So I'm trolling and all of a sudden I spot it down the aisle and I'm headed there. And all of a sudden I see someone just turning the aisle from the other way, coming down the wrong way. And I know what's about to happen. And so what do I do? Right? Yes. I pray that God will stall their car supernaturally so I can slip right in the space 
and then that's done. And so all of a sudden, I, I speed up through the parking lot, and that little car just kind of turns around and goes in this parking spot, and I go by them. And so here is this battle between that of my old nature and new nature, because what I want to do is I want to get out of the car and give them a piece of my mind. Don't always give them a real big piece of your mind. You don't have a lot to spare, right? So here's the thing. I want to give them a piece of my mind, and I want to kind of punch them in the nose with my flesh. And so all of a sudden, there's this battle battle in my life between that of the spirit, the regenerated part of me, and the ungenerated, regenerated part of me, and those desires collide. That's it. That's the way it works. Yeah. So what do I do? What do I do with this freedom in Christ that I have at that moment? Well, I get out, and I do the spiritual thing, right? I lay hands upon them. Isn't that true? Yeah. No, that's not what you do. No. You drive on, and you find another parking space, even if it's on the other side of the parking lot, and you go in, and you do your business, and you have overcome the flesh. For some of you, it's a lot serious, more serious than a parking spot, isn't it, this morning? Sure it is. For some of you, it's this desire to hate because you've been hurt. Ah. For some of you, it's a, it's a desire to lust because you feel like that you are entitled to that or you are rewarded by that this morning. For some of you, it's walking away from a relationship with someone that's not your spouse because the flesh inside of you has told you that they understand you more than your spouse does and all of a sudden you have this collision. What do you do? What do we do in those moments where we have this conflict? How do you conquer the flesh in you. That Greek word, sarx, how do you conquer that? Oh, I am so glad you asked that question. You are an amazing group of people. You ask always the right questions because Paul tells us, here's what he says, but through love serve one another. You say, Mark, there has to be something more than that. No, I don't wanna hear that because that's my problem right now, right? So through, through love, serve one another. It's the antidote. It's the antidote for using our liberty as an, as an opportunity for the flesh to be gratified, to serve and love one another. Why does Paul use that idea there? Why? Have you ever wondered? Well, I'm gonna tell you. It's because our flesh expects others to conform to us. Our flesh is always selfish. Our flesh is always looking after its own self. What better way to conquer the flesh than to do what is contrary to the flesh, amen? To do what is contrary to the flesh, and that is to serve and to love one another. Why? Because my flesh is driven by selfishness. Because selfishness is the root of sin because it's about me and taking care of me and getting what I want. I, you know, why didn't Paul say, no, wait a minute, here's the way you conquer the flesh in your life, that you just pray a lot more or you remember a lot more scripture or even you give more in the offering on a Sunday morning. You do that. No, how do you go to the very heart of your flesh? How do you drive a knife into that thing that's screaming at you to go against the things that you know that would break the heart of God? And this is how you do it. You simply love and serve one another. Well, Mark, why should I do that? I need a little more than what Paul is saying to me. Good. Paul knew that, I think. And so I I just thought about this. We should do that because there is a model in Scripture for you and I to live this way. And that model is Jesus. It is. Matthew 20 and 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
So since this is the pattern that Christ set for you and I, no one had more freedom than Jesus in this life on this planet, no one more than him. Yet what did he choose to do with his freedom? He chose to serve others is what he did. So in that pattern, then how does the way that you are currently living fit that pattern with Christ? How does your lifestyle fit that pattern? You say, Mark, this sounds a lot like legalism then. You're saying that I got to do things for God to save me. No, what God set you free from is that of you earning merit with him by the works that you do in this life. But God never set you free from that of you pleasing God through gospel motivation and love and doing the things that God wants you to do in this world. So what are you doing with this opportunity? Because loving one another, according to Paul, is about, or overcoming our flesh, according to Paul, is about loving and serving each other. Because that's the thing that's most contrary to our flesh. Because our flesh is founded on selfishness. And when we do the opposite of selfishness, we conquer the flesh within us. Wow. But Mark, I'm having this problem right now and and you just don't understand. So I'm having this problem with my flesh right now and this temptation, this desire in my life. Well then, Paul says, then take your eyes off yourself and put your eyes on serving and loving others and you will find that God conquers the flesh. I think it's an amazing thought. Can I read more? Thank you, verse 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. I just could imagine being in this room the first time, being in that room the first time that this letter is read to the churches in Galatia. And Paul, in his writing, says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. When their ears must have perked up, like, wow, this is great, let's hear this. And then he says, what they didn't expect to hear, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. For the whole law is fulfilled. In, in, uh, for the whole law is fulfilled. This was the, the idea of the legalists. This is what those Judaizers were teaching. That you can't just keep part of the law. You've got to keep it all. You've got to keep it perfectly in order for God to love you and for God to accept you. So for the whole law is fulfilled. And so what had happened is the rabbis had searched all through the Pentateuch and they had found all the laws and the rules they could find and they amassed 613 rules that you must live by in order to go to heaven. 613. Most of you in this room struggle with 10. Most of you struggle with five. Do I need to keep going? You get the point, right? Absolutely. So Paul's saying, hey, hang on for a moment. Let me share some really good news with you that the whole law is fulfilled in one word, and that is love. Let me give you some direction on how to carry out that love. And he says this, love your neighbor as yourself. And here's what Paul does. He actually takes this from the Levitical law. I don't know if you know this or not, but that is part of the law. It's the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 18. Now, you know it's a serious Sunday when you read out of Leviticus, right? It is, yes. Leviticus 19, verse 18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So Mark then what you're saying is that if I love the person sitting next to me, then that relinquishes me from all the other commands in Scripture from God. Because tomorrow I'm facing a situation and there's some lies I really need to tell tomorrow, you know, to to kind of get me out of a, a tough spot in life. And I'll tell you no, and I'll tell you why. Because loving your neighbor as yourself embodies all the other commands. It does. It involves all of them. If you don't start there, you will miss the mark in all of them. What do you mean? Thou shalt not steal. 
Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not commit adultery. What are they all based on? They're based on selfishness, aren't they? Self-gratification. It's what I desire or what I think I need, and then I make a way to feel that need in my life. Loving your neighbor as yourself counteracts all of those. So you said something to your neighbor earlier, right? So what are you doing with your freedom in Christ? I don't want you to say anything to them, nothing, but just look at them for a moment. Do you mind looking at them for a moment? Just look at them. You say, Mark, this is really weird, church. I will not come back here. I, I, just, just give me a moment. But here's what I want to say. It's going to be very difficult for you to murder them when you're loving them as yourself. Isn't that true? Now, if you had that thought coming to church this morning, please come up and pray with us after service. We need to pray with you. We really do. Yeah. And then we will get you some help. Absolutely. Because it's difficult for me to steal from you if I'm loving you as myself. Yeah. It's difficult for me to commit adultery with you if I'm loving you as myself. Do you see how you counteract the works of the flesh in your life? Wow. It's almost as if it's too simple, isn't it? Yeah. It's almost as if, Mark, this, this, is, this is almost like too easy. No, no. God makes it easy for you and I to understand. You see, loving you, loving you as myself is more than just me having, a, I think, a good self-image. And a good self-image is extremely important, and I'm not devaluing that at all. But it's more than just me having a good self-image of myself and then projecting that on you. Because I want to tell you, there's sometimes that my self-image is not where it needs to be. Sometimes Mark doesn't like Mark, and you, you understand what I mean, right? We don't like ourselves. So in that case, then I can project that on you as well. And no, it's not that at all. In fact, it's what I think the writer says, Paul writes in chapter 6, which we'll get to some point, right? Verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So here's what Paul says to all the legalists, you know, all those people in those churches who are saying you got to, you got to, you know, you got to live by every letter of the law and you got to live by it perfectly is what you got to do. He's saying to all the legalists, hey, if you want to fulfill the law perfectly, then that's possible for you to do. And I think when he must have said to them, they've been, wow, this is what I've been waiting for. Finally, he has seen the light like he has come over to our side and he's saying, if you want to keep the law perfectly, here's how you keep the law perfectly. Get ready for it. Here it comes. And then he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But then there's an alternative to this. And the alternative is what we read a few moments ago. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Did you hear that? If you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Because when I look at this, what I realize is that loving one another Serving one another, loving you as I love myself is the safety that prevents you and I as Christians from consuming each other. You say, Mark, that is very odd. Hang on for a moment. You say, Mark, this is church. We don't do that here. Listen, who is Paul writing to? Paul is writing to the church. Paul is writing to people that profess to be Christians. And he said, if you bite and devour one another... Because what I realize is this, that outside of loving and serving, outside of loving and serving, we have the propensity, we have the propensity in this very room to become a pack of wild animals. Again, this would be a great time to pray and leave, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mark, you've just said that we have this propensity to become a, a pack of wild animals. Well, that's what Paul is saying, that you're going to bite and devour each other. You're going to consume one another. 
outside of loving and caring for each other. So you become like these wild animals. Why? Because they're focused on their own needs. And if they get hungry enough, what do wild animals do? They eat their own, correct? Just think about that for a moment. This is exactly how, and I'll move on real quick, so give me a minute, okay? And we'll move on and you can breathe. But this is how the church abuses its liberty found in Christ. This is it, that we promote our own selfishness. We degrade to some corporate life of navel gazing, looking inside of ourselves all the time and and meeting our own needs. We're inwardly focused and the result of that is that we devour and we bite at one another. That is the result of all of that because here is legalism and legalism is founded on self-preservation and selfishness. And Paul knows that and he says the antidote to legalism in your life is to love and care for each other as you do yourself. You've been in a church like that. It's a pack of wild animals devouring and simply biting at each other. The lobby conversations have degraded from that of being gospel conversations to gossip conversations. Oh, I am winning friends and influencing people up here today, aren't I? Yes. No, it's it's truth. It is truth. And so what happens is when the church loses sight of this understanding of how we combat our flesh in the spirit and that is loving and caring for one another as we love and care for our own selves, when we lose sight of that, then we become a fishbowl of piranha that feed on each other. And the sobering part about this is that the propensity for that to happen is here in this very room this morning and it is our flesh. Resident in our flesh. And Paul says, hey, if you wanna live at the level of wild animals, then abuse your freedom in Christ by not serving and loving each other. And then at some point, you're gonna be someone's lunch, is what he says. True. You see how important Paul goes to such length to talk to you and I about how that we combat and conquer the work of the flesh within inside of us, the desire that's inside of us. And how we combat that, he says, is that you love each other as you love yourselves. Because our desires are based on selfishness and how would you counteract selfishness by simply doing the exact opposite of that? Wow. I promised I would move on. I move on, right? Verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So let's get into this for a moment. We have a few minutes left. What does it look like to walk by the Spirit then? So he says, here's what you do. Here's the alternative to this way of life. Then what does it look like for you to walk by the Spirit? In contrast to you submitting to the flesh and the desires of your flesh, what does it look like for you to walk by the Spirit? Because when we walk by the Spirit, we naturally will not fulfill and gratify the desires of our flesh. We will not. It's Romans chapter 8 and verse 4. In order that the righteous uh, requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So what he's saying is this. It's not possible for you to walk in righteousness apart from walking by the Spirit. It's not possible for you to do that at all. And it's not possible, but it is possible, he says, for you to live a righteous life as you are walking by the Spirit. And what the legalists will say and what those others will say, hey, no, it's not Jesus only, but it's Jesus plus your works, then what they will say is only legalism can make you righteous. That's not true at all. What legalism does, legalism redefines our righteousness. It transitions it to self-righteousness. So what does it mean to walk by the Spirit? 
Here are three things real quickly. To walk by the Spirit means that the Holy Spirit lives in you. Realize that. At the moment of your conversion, that the Holy Spirit found resident in your, residence in your life. The Holy Spirit lives within you. It's not this outside, inside battle. It's a battle on the inside of you between your desires for your own selfishness and God's desires for your life. And so the Holy Spirit lives in you. I think the second thing is this. To walk by the Spirit means to be open and sensitive to the influence of the Holy Spirit. To hear the Holy Spirit through Scripture, to hear the Holy Spirit through others who are walking by the Spirit, to hear the Holy Spirit speak to your heart when you come here on a Sunday morning and the Scriptures are read and then the Scriptures are taught to you, that you open yourself to the influence of the Holy Spirit. But there has to be another step for you and I. And that is that to walk by the Spirit means to pattern your life after the influence of the Holy Spirit, to simply do what the Spirit speaks to you in your heart. So how can I tell if someone is walking by the Spirit or how can I tell if I am walking by the Spirit? It's John 15 and verse 26. But when the Helper comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And I read this text and I thought, this is amazing because truly it gives us the answer to this question. How can I tell if I am walking by the Spirit or if someone is walking by the Spirit? Because when someone walks by the Spirit, they're listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying to them and he's gonna guide them in the nature of Jesus and our life will tell the story of Jesus, because if we're walking by the Spirit, we will look a lot like Jesus. Wow. If we are walking by the Spirit, we're going to look a lot like Jesus is exactly what is being said to us. And then he says, you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. Here's the thought, and I, and I have to get to these last verses real quick here. But the thought is this, that our conduct does not cause the Holy Spirit to find residence within us. That's not why he indwells you and I. Understand that. But our conduct reflects the work of the Holy Spirit within you and I. It's the proof of his residence within us. It's not the basis for his residence within you and I, because that's the gospel. So we don't deserve this. We can't earn this from God. It is a free gift from God to you and I. But our conduct does reflect the work of the Spirit within our life. Ephesians 2 and verse 3. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And what I realize is that it's not possible to gratify and fulfill the desires of my flesh while I'm walking by the Spirit because they don't coexist. They don't go hand in hand. They don't work together in any way of our life whatsoever. And so we have the struggle. We have the struggle. The Holy Spirit never moves you to fulfill the sinful desires of your heart, but he teaches you about Jesus as we read this from the book of John that he guides you in the path of Christ, that he empowers you in the moments of your weakness, that he convicts you when you fail and you don't get this right, and there will be those days when you don't get that right, and he draws you to the Savior. So let me finish verse 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for those who are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are under the law. So the struggle is real this morning. It is real. And Paul says, but if you are led by the Spirit, <clears throat> excuse me, then you are not, <clears throat> you're not under the law, is what he says. That part stuck with me. It stuck with me in such a powerful way 
that the antidote to the, to the flesh in my life is not found in the law and it's not found in this list of rules. It's not found in, in the manuals. That's not it at all, but it's found in the spirit, not under the law. And so I found this text in the last one I read to you in the book of Jeremiah 31 and 33 this morning. And I think it describes what Paul is saying to you and I so powerfully in the book of Jeremiah. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord, that I will put my law within them. And I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. And what I realize is this for you that, that are struggling this moment, that you're in this battle between that of the desires of your flesh and the desire of the spirit within your life. And you find yourself in this war in your life this morning that, that it is not a, a list of rules and, it, and it's not some manual. It's not you trying better to overcome this. None of those things at all, but it is the spirit that is resident in your life this morning. It's the spirit. So I think it comes down to trust and how much you trust God in this battle of your life. If you look back at the book of Genesis, the origin of the original sin was what? Distrust in God. It was a distrust in God's grace and God's goodness. It's no different today. And so what our flesh tells us in our life is, hey, you can do this, you can work this out, and you can make this happen, and what that is, that's a distrust in God's grace and his goodness. Because the war in I, my life and your life is really a war between two motivations this morning. It really is. One motivation leads us to Christ. The other to our own desires. The sinful nature, that old motivation system of our lives. It generates in our hearts, I think, what we perceive to be needs and then it creates these ways for you and I to meet those needs in our life. And that motivation in my life through the old nature, my flesh, will always be about me. It will cause me to focus on things that are out of place and priority in my life. Even good things, it will cause me to focus on to those things become idols in my life. It will cause me to say things like, I can have worth in my life if I'm just loved by this person. It will cause me to say things like that I could have worth in my life if I just had a good career or if my children loved me or if I was at peace with this individual in my life right now. Someone said that the old system of my life, the flesh creates this over desire and it makes those things idols for me. And so what I realize, what the Holy Spirit does in my heart and your heart this morning is that it doesn't point out the externals of my life but it points out places in my own heart where I refuse to trust and believe God. So where's that place in your life? Where is it? This is why we postponed our bonfire tonight. Good job, good decision, right? Yeah.
So when is the last time you have asked the Holy Spirit inside of you to point out areas of your life that you have failed to surrender to God? Areas in your life where there's distrust. Because that's where the sin originates from in your life, as it does in mine. You see, in this room, there's a battle raging that we can't see in the person next to you and in you yourself. And that's the battle of your old nature and your new nature. And Paul says, hey, you can conquer that. That can be conquered in your life. And Paul says, first of all, you got to put to death the selfishness of your life, the lack of trust of God. And you got to allow the Holy Spirit in those spaces of your heart. For those of you that are struggling to be accepted, And that's become an idol in your life. It's not a bad thing to be accepted. But it's become an over-desire. That's what our flesh does. Then for a moment, you allow the Holy Spirit to enter those places of your own heart. Because that's where change takes place. So for a moment, can I pray with you? and pray for you. Would you take a posture of prayer, however that might look for you? Your heads are bowed or are eyes closed? Are you just sitting there quietly? Because this is a moment for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. As a believer, he is resident in your life. As an unbeliever, then he is drawing you to Christ so that He can take a residence within you. So he's working in all of our lives this morning, regardless of the station that we find ourselves in on our spiritual journey. So Father, here we are as your kids, sitting before you on this beautiful Sunday morning, And as it seems so peaceful around us, there is a raging war inside of us today. And God, you are aware of that. And Father, that war is between our old nature and our new nature, our flesh and our spirit, our selfish desires and your desires for us, God. And so, Father, there are people in this room who you know so much, so much better than I because they're your kids who are struggling today with this battle in their life. A battle of temptation. A battle of a a desire to be accepted. a battle in a relationship. And so, Father, who wins? Our flesh or the Spirit? And so, Father, today we submit to your Spirit in our lives. God, we submit to that by doing the very opposite and counteracting what our Spirit or our flesh says. And God, we start this journey by loving our neighbor as ourself. Because nothing else makes sense unless we start there. 
So Lord, let us begin there today. And Father, we open up those areas of our heart today where there is distrust for you, there's an uncertainty of you, and we allow you to enter those spaces this morning, God, within us. And God, you will work through all the hurt and all the pain. You will work through all of those reasons that we have cataloged not to trust you. And you will get to our very hearts this morning because that's the way you work within us. So Lord, speak to us. Speak to us powerfully this morning as we sit here before you and we listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit within our lives. Thank you, Father. So for a moment, before we sing, can you just be still and know this morning and hear his voice in your life? Father, open our ears right now. Open our spiritual ears to hear you, God. Penetrate those deep, dark places of our lives that we have walled off as strongholds. Holy Spirit, we submit to your work in our life this morning. Do your work as only you can. Stand with us for a moment of worship before we leave this morning, please. Father, I fall 
into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Thanks for joining us today and spending this time with us. Before you leave, would you take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel or go on Facebook and comment there so that more people have the opportunity to hear this message. Also, if you'd like to further engage, go to our website at hopeandanderson.com and subscribe to our newsletter as well. We'd love to see you on campus sometime. Our services are at 9 and 11 a.m. And we would love to have you here in person. So again, thanks for your time and have a great day.